Welcome everybody to the Nightly News Podcast. This is Professor Paul Miller and we are sitting in today with Professor Thomas Davis. Tom is going to be giving a presentation as part of the CPC Film Series October 26th in the Capitol Blue Cross Theater at 6.30 p.m. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. We're also joined today by Nightly News Club President Brian Christiana. Brian, welcome back to the podcast. Gentlemen, this is a great day. It's great. I'm having a a good discussion with my two professors, and I consider you guys friends, so thank you again for having me. Well, you're very welcome, and we appreciate um, what you're doing in regard to the CPC Film Series this time. We're also going to chat with you uh, previously about some of the efforts that you've had uh, so far in making the CPC Film Series a reality and making it so successful. So, Brian, we'll chat with you in just a minute. So, uh, Professor Davis, we are going to be talking about Airplane in the CPC Film Series on October 26th. Just want to give a little background to those. Uh, maybe that this isn't something that necessarily registers. Coming up very closely to the 40th anniversary, Yes, because uh, it was released in 1980. But I do want to read some about the film's resume. With a budget of $3.5 million, it ended up grossing $83 million at the box office and went well over $125 million when considering home video sales and other ways that films were making money back in the 80s. Uh, in the years since films, the film's release, the film's reputation has continued to grow, and the film was ranked sixth on Bravo's 100 Funniest Movies. In a 2007 survey by Channel 4 in the UK, it was judged the second greatest comedy film of all time after only Monty Python's Life of Brian. In 2008, Airplane was selected by Empire Magazine as one of the 500 greatest movies of all time and in 2012 was voted number one in the 50 funniest comedies ever poll. More recently, in 2010, the film was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress. So that's a heck of a resume for a film to have. Yes, quite a quite a few accolades associated with this film um, over the years. Depending on depending on the year, depending on the polling agency, you'll see this anywhere from the greatest comedy film of all time to maybe as low as tenth, but it's usually near the top um, of most. Um, comedy film lists well what's interesting about a lot of these lists and we actually this was partially what we talked about with the big lebowski uh because the big lebowski ends up being on, on a lot of these types of lists mm -hmm. it's not so much necessarily the film itself but what impact that it had on future films is where because look i've seen some really funny movies that if you're asking me my favorite comedies i'd put them up there but they would never appear on the one of the 50 best comedies mm -hmm. you know I, I think of ones like kingpin you know, one a, a very funny movie, yeah. which actually is sort of, and we'll talk about this sort of comes from the airplane mm -hmm. genre, if mm -hmm. you will. But I think where airplane is really uh, important culturally is the fact that it spawned almost an entirely new genre of film. Can you speak to that? Yeah, it really did. Um, and I'll be talking about this too at the at the presentation. But essentially, all of the actors that were cast in the film Airplane had no prior comedic credits to in their acting careers. And that might come as strange when we see some of these actors like a, like a Leslie Nielsen or a, a Lloyd Bridges, whom we have seen in uh, comedy film after comedy film after comedy film. Um, we've seen Lloyd Bridges. He played a role on Seinfeld. I mean, these, these people have been around. They've been in a lot of things, but they didn't start off as comedic actors. And I think that's, that speaks a lot to the success of this film because it was all about how, how straight everybody could play it. So despite all of the, as we'll come to discuss at the movie night, despite all of the utter absurdity that surrounds every moment in this film, at this point, it, it, the film is just so funny because... All of the actors are being serious. Um, they don't. They, there are times where the fourth wall is broken in this film, but not very often by the actual main characters in the film itself. So, in essence, the the world that is captured in the film, the backdrop against which this movie takes place, I think, is what enables it to be so funny to begin with. Think about it. The 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 plot of this movie, if you separated it from the movie as we've actually seen it. There's nothing comic about the plot. 
we have a situation where an airplane takes off and there's um, you know a, a, a bout of, of food poisoning on the on the on the trip. Back and when you used to be provided meals on yes, your, your flights, yes, and you had to uh, that. There's nothing funny about the pilots being you know incapacitated to something like this and having to rely on a passenger to safely land this plane. So that doesn't sound funny at all in terms of the plot, right? It's interesting, though, when you read the plot. If you go on IMDb or if you read anything about the plot, it's very short and sweet. And it's very to the point. And mm-hmm. if somebody had no idea what this movie was or that it was a, a comedy piece, you'd read that plot and you'd probably get a whole different perspective of what the movie was actually going to be. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, a lot of the reason for that is it's actually a plot that was... Um, Taken from an existing film. Um, now, the, the movie itself is spoofing a lot of the disaster films of, of the 70s, like the airport. But it's actually modeled on a, a um, feature called Zero Hour. 1957. 1957, yeah. So um, so the plot already existed. The, uh, the, the film company owned the rights to both of them. So they were able to take that plot and, and use a lot of the things without having to change anything because they had the rights to the movie. And all they did was ins- instead of making it a comedy by bringing in over the top personalities and, 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 and things like that, they still brought in a whole stable of, of, of straight, serious, dramatic actors. And it's really that, that deadpan delivery of everything that, uh, that where the, that's where the comedy comes from in this movie. What's interesting is, uh, and we've talked about this before because, uh, you know, every quarter, that individual that's doing the CPC film series we have down and we, we ask some of these same types of questions. What was it about this film? That because to me, when I picked The Big Lebowski, mm-hmm. The Big Lebowski was one of uh, maybe 10 to 15 different options that I was brainstorming to myself of films that I might mm-hmm. want to screen. You know, outside of maybe some logistical things that, that happened with licensing, why was this the film that you decided to choose when it came time to do yours? Well, I'll tell you. Um I have to admit that when this movie first came out, I obviously didn't see it. Um, I was two year I wasn't born. I would be born two years after after this film came out. So I didn't actually see see this entire film until I was, I believe, a junior in high school. And so by that time, I thought I, I had understood what comedy really was. You know, the, the stuff that I'd grown up in, and the stuff that those in my peer group were watching and such. Um, but then I, I I discovered this because of an interest in the Naked Gun film series, which you know uh, many people are familiar with. That that's where we might know Leslie Nielsen from um, the most. So I I, I kind of had to go back and look at that, and I realized then that you know so much of the comedy that I started taking for granted as like well this is just what people find funny that the roots of that sort of comedic style had been laid long before, you know, before I had ever thought that that, that, that sort of thing was going on. So I think that in, in that respect, that's why this movie kind of remains timeless. Um, it's not like it's a plot that really depends upon the, the time period or anything like that. Well, another question that I had for you here is, so you talked early on about, you know, watching this in high school and, and moving on and mm-hmm. sort of having a greater appreciation for comedy films. What impact did this film have on you? Because to me, The Big Lebowski had a huge impact on me in, if nothing else, just my appreciation of film and the different types of layers that film could have. And really, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to see mm-hmm. The Big Lebowski in the theater. I still have my ticket stuff. Wow. Yeah, I know. Tell me about mm-hmm. it. I'm glad I, and this one I, I found recently I thought was very interesting. But for me, The Big Lebowski was, you know what? This is a different way to do a comedy. Mm -hmm. This is something that is very unique and different. And it really helped me understand more my appreciation of film and filmmaking. What impact did Airplane have on you when you first saw it? Or maybe it was years later till it had this this impact on you. I think that might be tough for me to, um, to really break down into words as far as... I mean, really, like I said, it, it taught me it, it, the impact it had on me was that it it presented you know 
that that comedy is something that can be realized in in so many different ways. And and like you're saying, so if you look at the comedies of that period as well, none of them were like Airplane. So in the sense, like when the a film like The Big Lebowski came out, in in essence, it wasn't really like a lot of the other movies that that it was coming out alongside. And I think the same thing the same thing is true for Airplane. But for me, what what stood out was 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 just just the utter ridiculousness of the whole thing. Because, you know, as I'm going to talk about on that night, you know, we are constantly surrounded by absurdity. We, I mean, we live in, an, in, in, a, in a universe that is marked by, you know, what, philosopher, what the philosopher Camus identified as absurdity. Um, and what this movie does, in essence, is it, it, it doesn't deny the absurdity. It revels in it. And that's kind of where the comedy comes from. It's almost like, you know, you'd have to picture... Uh, Sisyphus pushing the rock up the giant hill, you know, condemned to roll that hill. You almost have to picture him turning to the camera and giving that like, can you believe what I have to put up with sort of look at the camera? You'd have to picture him being being happy and laughing at that very situation. That also seems absurd, but that's really what it, what what absurdity boils down to is laughing in spite of uh, the utter absurdity of the situation we find ourselves in. Um, I won't go too much into some of the philosophical import on that. I, I, I promise I will keep that part portion brief during the talk. I'm going to kind of lead in with that, but really just as a stepping stone for us to start talking about absurdist comedy. Well, the last question I want to talk to you, then we're going to move to Brian and talk about a sort of another aspect of this presentation, something that the Nightly News is very proud of. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what has happened since Airplane. Now, you'd, you'd early men- earlier mentioned uh, the Naked Gun films, which mm-hmm. I do think that people are maybe a little bit more familiar with as far as from a recency perspective. But this has had a profound impact on many popular movies over the last 40 years, mm-hmm. right? Whether it's the Fairly Brothers and things like Kingpin or whether it's the Hot Shot series or even to Scary Movie. In fact, Peter Fairley of the Fairly Brothers said, quote, Seeing Airplane for the first time was like going to a great rock concert, Mm -hmm. like seeing Led Zeppelin or the Talking Heads. We didn't realize until later that what we'd seen was a very specific kind of comedy that we now call the Zucker Abrams Zucker School. So what he's saying is this film changed everything. And he even goes on to say, I'll tell you right now, if the Zuckers didn't exist, there would be no Fairly Brothers. And I think that that's very interesting, and I think that that's why some of these polls rank Airplane so high, because of the impact mm-hmm. that it had on film. And that's one one of the things I spoke about whenever I did The Lebowski, because of the specific type of film it was. So right. can you talk about maybe some of the other people who were impacted by the existence of these films? Set up, I, I can give you a, a very modern example. I don't know if, uh, if you've ever watched um, Seth MacFarlane's show, Family Guy. Of course. Um, but show. Great there show. Is, yeah, I would agree. There's, um, there's a huge nod toward that kind, of, that kind of humor in there. If you've ever seen that show, you know that the situations that, that they end up in are, are utterly absurd yeah. and, and, and entirely implausible. And it seems that many of the situations in the show are created just as a means of setting up a cutaway or a flashback. So it really becomes the plot and all of that stuff is really secondary to just over the top, irreverent sort of subjects and just ridiculous laughter. Um, but I mean, Family Guy is an example. Obviously, obviously, a lot of the a lot of the uh, modern sort of adult cartoons that you can put alongside a Family Guy. I think. Your Simpsons. Are yeah, there. your 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 Simpsons. Even um even uh, the new uh, the new show on Netflix, that Disenchantment show. I mean, any yeah. any of those, there are still vestiges of sort of the, the 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 stuff that Airplane gave rise to. Mine South Park, I'm going to be honest with you. South Park, mine. too. I, oh, I love it. But, like, they, I'm sorry to cut you off, no. Mr. Miller. But these shows, like you're saying, they're like, they leave you many question marks and there's cons- a lot of conspiracies in these shows. Like, a good example is Stewie on Family Guy. Mm. Who is his... Re- we don't think that Peter's his real yeah. father. And we just... I don't know. We and don't know. And they're also completely satisfied with not tying up loose ends. Yes. Which is another mark of absurdist sort of surreal comedy like this. Is yeah, that, I mean, there's a dog that talks. <laughs> right. Um you don't necessarily need to have the happy Hollywood ending exactly. to everything. Yeah. You could just kind of leave it where it is. Yeah. 
So everybody, I want everyone to save the date for Friday, October 26th for Airplane. 6 o'clock, the doors will open. Uh, at 6.30 will be your presentation, uh, Professor Davis. And at 7 o'clock, we will do a screening of the film, followed by a brief Q&A at the end. So please, everyone, get there early. And this is why. And this is where I'm going to bring you in. Now, Brian, we will get to the fundraiser that the Nightly News yep. is doing in just a minute. But now that, and you've been and had a part in every single one of the CPC film series, as you look back, this is, we're going to com be completing our fourth uh, installment of the CPC film series. What does this mean, not only to our department, to our club, who we've been heavily involved with this all along, but also the opportunities for students to get to engage in these types of uh, opportunities? Well, that was one of the big things. Like when I came to Central Penn College, I was all about getting involved, getting different opportunities. And I feel like the that the communications department has really helped me with that. I mean, the CPC film series for Jared Rife's Jaws, I wrote a story on it. For The Big Lebowski, I opened up for you. And then for Bran Ellsworth, I was doing the camera work for it. So, I mean, that was a really big, that was a really big deal. And, I mean, I'm, I've said this before, coming from a small area, and Professor Davis can vouch for me on this one, uh, it, this, is a, this is a lot. And this is really, Central Penn offers that for students as a small school with a small class size and the small numbers can really help you branch out as a person. Uh, this, but only if you take advantage of and the that's opportunities. that's what you have to do. Like people, I, this is a funny story, and I'm not trying to come off as arrogant. People, please don't think of it this way. <laughs> I'm standing in the lobby with Eileen Baylor, nicest lady I've ever, one of the nicest ladies I've ever met. And the nightway is on, and the TV right around there. And this guy walks up into the lobby area, looks over at the TV, looks at me, looks back at the TV, and then looks at me. <laughs> and then he goes, is... He, and I said, hey, how you doing, buddy? Like, that was probably, that's one of the biggest moments of my life so far. Hmm. Like, that's really cool. And I feel like at Central Penn, they offer me that. I'm very thankful, like, with my job and everything. But, yeah, like you said, students need to take advantage of that. And I was literally telling uh, a student at uh, one of the new incoming freshmen, I said, you can generally take this place as your own. It's not that hard. You just want, you have to do it. Because he said, I want to meet everybody. I said, fine, I'll help you do that. It's not that hard. You just want, you mm -hmm. have to make the effort. Right. It's all about opportunity. And I talk about this, I'm sure you guys get sick of hearing me talk about this, but you know, we, Professor Davis, myself, Professor Olympi, Professor Chow, Dr. Whaler, everyone that's involved in our communication department over the last handful of years, let's say five years, has done nothing but try to create more opportunity, whether that's yes. more internship opportunity, the job shadowing initiative, developing this podcast studio, putting out our quarterly publications. It's all opportunity. And that's why if anybody leaves here and they are sort of unhappy with the experience or, or hands-on opportunities that they got, there's nowhere else to look but in the mirror. And that's one thing like even the nightly news with when uh, we brought in Glenn and Bob in, that's a good opportunity for you to get uh, the communication students, that's someone that they can meet. Mm -hmm. I mean, these even just going to these job fairs that you're offering, how can we say no to that? That's a good way to get your name out there and make connections. So, I mean, Central Penn, kudos to you, really. Well, thank you. And uh, in addition, I do think as we look back at the CPC film series that I think that even we all as as the people who are in front of the audience doing this, uh, I was pleasantly surprised by the attendance of, of this first year. And of course, I, f I believe that it's only going to get better. And I'm hoping to set an attendance record myself. I, I hope, and you know, I hope it generally gets bigger and bigger every term. That's the point. Because I mean, as you said on the, well, we brought this up in the Big Lebowski. It was on Penn Live's things to do over the weekend. Which I was honored by to, yeah, see, that's a pretty big to deal. see my name in, that is a big deal. in Penn Live. So. Like, I mean, Penn Live is really getting involved with our school, it seems like and uh because they were just on what the sga and the food pantry right. and which which is one thing that's going to be a, a big opportunity for students with the airplane films absolutely well i want to chime in about that as we uh wind down here the last thing that i wanted to bring up and something as far as nightly news goes we will be and the reason that i encourage everybody to get there at six o'clock on october 26th is because we are going to be offering food uh we're going to be offering sandwiches and soup um, we're also going to be offering popcorn, soda, and movie theater candy. 
for donation. There's going to be no cost associated with it, um, and we want, if somebody comes out and wants to get a bite to eat, they're welcome to that. We are just asking for any donations that are available. Um, we are not, in uh, comparison or con- in contrast to what we did with mine, using it as a club fundraiser, what we are actually doing is we are, are going to give any proceeds that we yes. get to the college pantry we are also accepting any donations of canned goods um, non-perishable food items and toiletries that could be shared with our campus uh, our college pantry Uh, so this is something that the nightly news thinks very very strongly about we've wanted to do something nice for the pantry as a way to give back to um, college as a way to give back to the college but to give back to the students and we're still in its infancy of the pantry and there's as as anyone who's seen the pen live video from last week knows there's still some empty shelves in there and we need to we need to take care of that so i, I it is very important to me and to the club yes. that, that this is something that we're doing so just quickly brian and then i'll come back to you tom for the answering the same question what does it mean to you to have this opportunity to give back beyond the nightly news and to give back to the college pantry and to do this fundraiser for them? Well, yeah, giving back to the Central Penn area, the Central Penn community, it, it's really good. It makes you feel good inside. Helping, I mean, I know this is like my nonprofit for homecoming this year, but it's like a neighbor helping another neighbor. You, you're always looking for someone to help. It could be in any way, but it, it always makes you feel good inside. And I think. We need more people like that in this world. So I feel like the nightly news is doing, they're really going, we're, we're really doing a good thing. Well, I think it's fantastic not only that you've taken to working with the College Pantry, but you've also taken to helping out in this particular case where uh, we can do so. Tom, uh, coming back to you, what does it mean to you to be affiliated with the College Pantry in this way? I mean, this is a big deal for you mm-hmm. personally to do this and one of the things that we started talking about very, very early on was that you, you were very interested in doing a fundraiser for the pantry. So what does this mean to you? I mean, let's face it, it it's hard to be a college student. Um, you know, they, college students have so much on their plate. Um, oftentimes what they don't have on their plate is enough food, though. You, you have a lot of students like to go home for weekends, but not every student has the ability to go home for weekends. Um, and so, you know, students are stressed. They're, they're, they're picking classes. They're taking classes. They're, they're, they're doing assignments for classes. They're, they're doing job shadowing. They're doing a hundred different things. And plus you're trying to contain a social life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, they run short on things. I mean, and it, it's, it's, it's a lot harder to be able to focus on, on, on what you're here for as a college student when, you know, some of the, some of your basic needs on Maslow's hierarchy, right. Aren't, aren't really being taken care of. So, um, I, I'm, I'm really happy about this because, you know, we, we're reaching out to the community. We're, we're, we're building relations with the community. Um, and we're also showing, you know, that, 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 that we, we care about our students, that it, that it's more than what they do or do not learn, that we care about the whole individual and that, you know, if, if they are, if they're satisfied, if they're comfortable, they are more likely to fully engage with the college community that surrounds them. So, uh, you know, something like this is, is, is very huge. It, I don't want to say very huge. That's a little redundant, but this is huge, um, for our, for, for all of our students here. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's a great cause and why not laugh as we raise the funds and we appreciate uh your willingness to work with the nightly news media club as uh we we want to give back to the college pantry so and brian thank you very much for um helping to organize this thank you very much for being a part of the cpc film series uh and i i guess i didn't think about all the different ways that you had been involved in the cpc film series until you'd mentioned it so you're going to hit the uh the, uh, so kudos to you, Brian. Yeah, Namaste, you- my friends. <laughs> Namaste. Well, uh, Brian, thank you very much. We appreciate your not only time being here, but again, your efforts with the CPC Film Series. I think this is something that you'll remember for the rest of your life. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And Tom, please, everybody, save the date. Friday, October 26th. Doors open at 6. Food will be from 6 until 7 o'clock. We will have a snack stand that'll be open until, you know, through the movie with snacks and drinks. Um, when you do come into the Capitol Blue Cross Theater, we'll be right there to your left in the kitchenette. We will have sandwiches. We will have soup, popcorn, candy, soda. Uh, 
we're going to make it a good movie going experience. So uh, I just thank you very much for for coming down today, and not only that, be the willingness to partner up with the Nightly News, Professor Davis. Absolutely, thank you. All right, so we'll see everybody on Friday, October twenty sixth. So uh, we're, that's going to be all for this segment of the podcast. So uh, for Nightly News President Brian Christiana, always a pleasure to have you on, Brian. Thank you, sir. Namaste. <laughs> and for uh, Professor Thomas Davis, Tom, always a pleasure to have you on, and we hope to have you on again soon talking about some of the communications initiatives that we've been working on you over bet. the past year. You bet. Um, but in the meantime, good luck, and we hope that this CPC film series just goes off without a hitch and we're able to donate some money and some food to the College Pantry. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. All right, everybody, we will catch you on the other side of the break when we welcome Financial Aid Director Kathy Shepard to the program. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Brian Christiana. Thank you for listening to the Nightly News Podcast, a part of the Nightly News Media Club here at Central Penn College. Welcome to the Nightly News Podcast. This is Professor Paul Miller, and I'm sitting in today with the Director of the Financial Aid Department, Kathy Shepard. Kathy, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me. You are certainly welcome. We actually just figured out it's been almost a year since we've had you down. What's going on? Since in the last year, what's been going on in the financial aid department? We're just keeping busy, making sure students stay enrolled and can afford uh, Central Penn education. That's what I like to hear. Well, we have a lot of things to talk about today. Um, we had specifically been planning this for quite some time because October is always a big month in the financial aid office because of FAFSA opening up. Um, today, we're also going to talk about um, student loan checks. We're also going to talk about the impact that dropping classes might have. And of course, registration is going to come up in week four, and we're going to talk about some areas where you can get some help. Of course, we're also going to talk about the Education Foundation and opportunities that are there, and of course, our federal work-study program. So we got a lot to talk about. Yes, we do. So the first thing let's start off with was the FAFSA. The FAFSA opens in October, and so I would like to just give you this opportunity to chat a little bit more about maybe for students who maybe didn't do this the first time or had a little parental help. Uh, can you talk about some tips for filling out the FAFSA? Something that's new and exciting this year is the federal government has created a mobile app. So students can now download what's called My Student Aid. So you have two ways of completing your FAFSA form. You can go to fafsa.gov or download the mobile app at My Student Aid. As Paul had mentioned, the FAFSA is now open and we're just asking that you go ahead and do so. We will be holding workshops on a monthly basis here starting in November. So if you need help, please stop into the workshops or anytime. Room 18, we are more than happy to help you with your FAFSA. What are the types of questions that uh, from new students that come in about the FAFSA that you get that maybe some frequently asked questions that you might just be able to share some quick answers to? Yes. It's kind of confusing because they use their, your 2017 income. So you can go ahead and do the FAFSA. You don't have to wait for taxes, um, but you do have to have your 2017 income for both you and your parents if applicable. Um, most important thing is just doing it on time so you don't lose grant money. That's the most important. Biggest tip I could give. And that's only, so the FAFSA is only open through the end of the year, is that correct? Or does it go into next year? It goes all the way till next year. But in order to get grant money, you have to have it done by May 1. We really want it done by Christmas. That way you don't have any issues with your financial aid package moving forward. Awesome. Now you said if applicable, where mm -hmm. is the time that it's not necessarily applicable that you need your parents? Is there a certain age that comes along yep. with that? If you're over the age of 24, support a child, veteran, pretty much what they consider an independent student. All right, fantastic. So everybody, please make sure, and, and as Kathy mentioned, uh, it's best to just try to get this done before the end of the year, so that's one less thing to worry about. You know, I, I almost use this in terms of how students register for classes. While uh, open registration is open weeks four, five, and six, I typically try to highly encourage my students to do it early because if you do it early, that's one less thing that you have to worry about that's stressing you out. We're all stressed out about a multitude of things, and to do something like this early, get it out of the way, it's really going to be beneficial for, for our students, um, not only from the FAFSA, but with course registration too. That's going to bring me to my next question, Kathy. One of the things that I think that a lot of students might not quite understand is the ramifications of dropping a course and how that impacts financial aid. Could you chat a little bit more about what those ramifications are and maybe some of the questions you might ask a student if they come into your office and ask, should I drop this class? Okay. So first thing is I want students to know is how much money they are losing by dropping a class. I, hope, I don't know if students realize, but the courses are about $1,500 a course. 
So without with you dropping it or only trying so far, you're actually using financial aid that you could use for future terms. So it's very important of why you're dropping the class. Is it because it's not going well? Are you really failing the class? Because what we wanna make sure is financial aid is very limited. So we wanna make sure that students aren't just dropping the class because they just wanna drop it. So is there a textbook issue? Is there a a scheduling conflict or whatever? But the biggest thing is the course is about $1,500 and that's financial aid you can't get back. So it's not like you can regain that money by retaking it again. Now that said, if in future terms you might, uh, let's just say, drop after the first week. Let's say you sign up for the class, you go to the first couple class or the first class, and you realize that it might not be for you. Um, is there so even if they would drop at the end of the first class, what type of financial aid ramifications does that have? Great. If you attend a week one, yes, you are charged for the course. You are charged twenty five percent, and you use financial aid against that. So your financial aid is still being used even though you drop the course. But at the same time, when you go beyond that, it's all or nothing, right? Correct. Week one, it, you're charged 25%. Week two, it's 45%. And then after that, we, week three and beyond, you're charged 100%, even if you elect to drop it after that point. And again, not that we want people to drop classes, but if you find yourself that you've maybe erroneously taken a class, maybe you're thinking about changing a major, you do still have that opportunity within week one or two to recoup some money. But it is important to note that once you are in class that first day of class, then there is some financial aid ramifications. Is that correct? That is correct, because then that leads to what's called satisfactory academic progress. You have to pass 66% of your classes at all time because a W does count as a course not successfully passed in financial aid, as well as keeping your QM GPA above the 2.0. So another thing that I wanted to talk about is help with registration. So we talked about the importance of signing up for classes early, uh, just as one less thing that you have to worry about as far as from a stress standpoint. However, one thing I've noticed, and you know, I'll be honest with you, Kathy, one of the things that when I first started here that I really jumped on was the opportunity to advise students because I know that so many students are confused about when to take certain classes and what modality. Maybe it's offered in one modality, but they don't necessarily prefer it that way. You know, I want to make sure that I can help my students with course registration. Uh, Obviously, we have adopted the Student Advising Center. And that's going to be a wonderful opportunity for our students to get the advising that they need. Why do you think, and of course this is speculation, why do you think sometimes so many of our students just want to do it on their own and then what ends up happening is they take classes that they don't need and that impacts their financial aid? Why do you think that might be? If I had to guess, people are sometimes afraid to ask for help. But that's what we're all here for. We're here to support and help the students graduate timely. But but when there's that much money on the line, I I guess I'm just, I I still to this day don't understand necessarily why our students don't want to reach out for, for more help. Because even though we do have this student advising center, there are multiple areas in addition to that, whether it's just in your own department, the chair of your department, the program coordinator of your department, you can always go to them and ask for help as well. So the Student Advising Center doesn't necessarily mean that if you were with an advisor previously, you felt very comfortable with them. It doesn't necessarily mean you can't go back there, So, which mm-hmm. is something that I wanted to, to point out. So you, it is important to know, everyone, That when you do drop and add classes, it does impact your financial aid, but it is also important to make sure that you're speaking with someone, whether it's financial aid, whether it's the the professors and faculty in your department, or whether it's the student advising center. You have to find somebody to give you just a little bit of assistance. And if nothing else, doing that might give you some peace of mind that, hey, I'm confident now that I'm choosing the right classes. That is correct. And there's always classes that you may not want to take. But you got to take them in order to graduate. You just got to do it. And we find that a lot that sometimes people are, they say, oh, you know, I'm going to hold off on taking that class. And that can have some some interesting ramifications, too. Okay. uh, Another thing that I wanted to chat with you about today is our federal work study program. You mentioned off air that we have a ton of opportunities here on campus to do work study. You'd mentioned that it's basically a part-time job here on campus that gives you the opportunity to work within several different departments. So could you, for somebody, let's just say, who's interested in maybe getting a part-time job here on campus, could you just describe in a little bit more detail what this federal work study program entails? Sure. Work study is, like you had mentioned, a part-time job. So there are several offices on campus that hire. The first thing to do is come into the financial aid office, give us a call or email to let us know 
that you're interested, you have to be eligible because it is based on your financial aid package. Once you're eligible, we will give you the list of people that are hiring. And the checks come to the students bi-weekly, just like a part-time job. So it's to help with books and supplies and just, you know, general cost of education. Um, however, it is run through the financial aid office. And it is important to note, as you mentioned, they do have to qualify. Yes. Um, and because that is something that's very important. Now, what are the qualifications that maybe just some basic things that you might be able to give to students? In technical terms, you have to have financial need. In other words, you have to fill your FAFSA. That's why it's also important to do it timely. So if you are eligible, you can get a job here on campus. Um, some students don't do it timely and they lose their positions. Um, so that's another reason. Um, but basically, it's financial need. Is that what it comes down to? But there's jobs off campus. You can get great experience at a local nonprofit organization and gain some experience there. So that's on and off campus. That's incredible. I didn't know that. Yes. What are some of the organizations that we've partnered with to do the federal work? Um, right now we do PCAR, Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. We also have a person who's going in and reading at local schools. Um, we need reading people to go in and actually read to students. There are certain requirements that we have to meet by participating in the program. Um, we've had um, many positions. I can't think of them off, off the top of my head, but there's other ones off campus that we work with. And that's amazing, too, because one of the things that we love to do here for our students is provide them an opportunity, not only on campus, but also mm -hmm. off campus and the partnerships that we've helped create over the years. I think that that's wonderful. You know, as an aside, and we'll come right back to some of the things that we were talking about, but in getting ready for this podcast today, I was doing a little research about some things that uh, had recently come out about financial aid, student loans, and those types of things. And the one thing that I wanted to point out, and this is just uh, from a recent I guess you it's not necessarily a study, but just disclosure of data from Sally May, who is obviously one of the largest financial aid providers. Mm -hmm. And there's some interesting trends that I'm seeing here. Uh, and basically what I'm looking at is a recent article from CNBC that uh, discloses how the average student funds their college education. And something that I've found very interesting over the years is – over the last five years, we've seen a 5% increase in the amount of money that's come from scholarships and grants, which I think is wonderful. Uh, we'll talk about uh, opportunities with the Education Foundation shortly, um, but one thing that I always try to explain in my CPC Foundations class, I do a unit about financial aid. In that unit, what I talk about is how to pay for your education. Okay, Now, obviously, loans are a way that most people – do help pay for their education. But it's not just about that. Whether it's parent support, whether it's you're working a job yourself and helping support in that way, but it really, I think, students so rarely consider the number of scholarships and grants that are out there. Can you speak to why that might be? Why do you believe that students don't take more of an advantage of some of the scholarships and grants? And before you answer that question, we had Sandy Box from the Education oh, Foundation great. on last uh, last week, and she had mentioned that we had about 120 applicants, which she was very pleased with. But that's only about 10 to 12 percent of our, our college population. So I guess my question is, why don't students think more about scholarships and grants when they're paying for their education? I think some of the dependent students think that mom and dad just take care of it, but don't realize how mom and dad are taking care of it through loans and have to pay it back, where the scholarships would help reduce the debt, whether it's your debt or your parents' debt. Anytime you can get free money, it's free money. So I think some of that has to play in it. And then some, I hate to say this, just don't want to write an essay. 300 word essay for a scholarship and you can win up to two thousand dollars two thousand dollars it's really unbelievable kathy because i sit in that meeting with you when we are, are going through the students and, and trying to allocate this money and it's it's often the same students yes. and that's wonderful um i've talked to many many students who have won multiple times i think what the problem is is very rarely is it put into perspective for them in that Okay, if you only use loans, your education here at Central Penn is going to cost X. Well, that X at a 6% interest rate, let's just throw that number out there arbitrarily, um, it will take you 10 years to pay back or 15 years to pay back. I think when you put it into that context, I think it's a little bit easier for the students to understand, okay, this is very serious and I need to take it seriously. 
A second thing I want to add was one of the people that I had talked to recently in my work in the community as far as trying to develop more partnerships, um, they worked at the um, City Hall down in Harrisburg. And one of my interns worked for an organization that offered scholarships. And do you know what they said? That almost every year they don't have any applicants even any applicants for their scholarships. Now, it might be because of the channels through which they are, are marketing those scholarships, uh, of course, but I, I guess I'm just so concerned why there's not more of a push to get students to sign up for, for some of these grants and scholarships. I know that I have a daughter who is a junior in high school, and uh, I've made it very clear to her that instead of necessarily getting a summer job this year, I would much prefer that she spend her time writing essays and applying for scholarships because in the long run, that's going to be much, much more worthy than maybe a summer job at a restaurant or, or something along those lines. So uh, it's very important for students to understand that there are so many scholarships and grants out there for all types of different majors, general scholarships as well that aren't tied to a specific major. So to that point, where do you suggest that students might go to look for these scholarships and grants? First thing is complete the FAFSA form. That's the first thing because that'll get you your state and federal aid. And then you really need to watch your central pen email. Because if we know about scholarships, meaning the financial aid office, we email it out and we also post it in Student Central. So that way they know it's a safe scholarship that they can apply for it. Because you want to be careful. You never, never should pay for applying for scholarships. Everything should be free. So there's companies out there that are trying to get you money from you to apply for scholarships. Again, applying for financial aid is free. Applying for scholarships is free. So you want to be careful of scams. That's very interesting because I've never heard of that before. Can you? Are there any common scams that you've heard of that are maybe more common than others? Um, well, one is FAFSA.com. If you go to FAFSA.com, they charge you like $69 to fill out your FAFSA. No, it's FAFSA.gov and it's free. So if you're paying for your FAFSA, which means you're, it's free. Um, there's also scams where if you give me $700, I'll make sure you qualify for all your maximum grants. Well, all you got to do is fill out the FAFSA right. form. Scams are out there. You have to be careful. Something else, uh, just a, a, a quote that I read, um, I thought that was very interesting. There has been a big rise in the number of people that have been filling out their FAFSA over the last few years. But however, despite that rise, millions of students who would have qualified for college grants still even fail to file their FAFSA. Again, do you think it's just maybe a lack of education in the higher education as a whole about, you know, maybe it's just easier for students to just sign up for loans as opposed to spending the time educating them and, and all that's out there in grants and scholarships? Oh, yes. It's, I mean, the loan applications are very simple, very you know straightforward compared to the FAFSA. However, taking that extra time, like you said, pays off with grants. Um, the state agency here in Pennsylvania is getting a little better where they don't have a separate form. So just because you do the FAFSA doesn't mean you're done. There's multiple steps or multiple more paperwork that needs to be done. So I think sometimes jumping to the loans is just easy because you avoid all paperwork. But that's not necessarily the right thing to do. And what's even more interesting is I think that um, with still have a very high percentage of first-time college mm -hmm. students, and maybe just some of them just don't know and just don't have any idea that all this money is out there available for them um, outside of loans even, whether mm -hmm. it's work-study, whether it's grants, um, and other scholarships. So I guess the... Bottom line is the uh, leaving uh, our podcast today is please, number one, make sure you're filling out your FAFSA, but don't just bank on loans as the only way to pay for your education. I even break it down for students as far as textbooks because textbooks on all college campuses are, are often a major problem because of their expense. And I, I try to share with students some different ways to think outside of the box when it comes to acquiring your textbooks. The library here does a wonderful job of trying to purchase and have as many of the textbooks for our classes on file as possible. Uh, even someone like me, I've donated a, my desk copy to the library for them to keep on reserve. And even uh, they, even just for example, one class I have this term has an ebook with access for up to three students at a time. Mm -hmm. So again, when you're looking for your books, uh, certainly trying to find them used where available, seeing if the library has them, um, or even just contacting a friend and, and splitting it with them. Uh, all of these decisions that are being made every single term by students makes a big impact. 
Yes, because what breaks my heart is sometimes when the student doesn't do well because they don't have the textbook. So you pay all this money for the course or the credits, but then you come up short just for another 100 or $200. With that said, um, if there's anything, the financial aid office, if you need anything as far as books, help with courses, um, help with paperwork, I have no idea what to do. Just walk into the financial aid office, which is room 18. Fantastic. Well, the last thing that I wanted to chat about before we let you get back to your very busy schedule is the uh, Education Foundation opening up again in January. So twice a year, and I know that uh, dedicated listeners will know when this opens because we always have Sandy down. It is important to note, and I've actually gone as far as to tell people to put it in their calendar. Uh, you know, make a note for January 8th when you come back to school in the winter that this is going to be open. And you know what the biggest issue that I have that I see with students as, as far as it goes is they forget they remember when they come back to school you know I have to do this and then they get you know the hustle and bustle of week one and then it's week two and then open registrations coming and there's just so much going on that a lot of times I think that students just don't remember um, not for any lack of us trying to promote it but uh, it is important to remember for students when as soon as you come back in the winter, as soon as you come back in the summer, those are the terms that the Education Foundation Scholarship essay are open. And again, please just take a little bit of time because it's, it, you know, I don't think we're giving away anything here by saying it's the, the most well done essays that are the ones that typically get the money. So please make sure that you're trying to uh, put some, some time into this. It's only 300 words, but at this, and I think sometimes that in itself is, is maybe part of the problem. They're thinking, ah, this is only 300 words. I'll just whip something together and send it in. And they don't realize how heavily they're scrutinized. The foundation is a great opportunity. We do send emails out. So again, if you're watching your emails, I know you get a lot, a lot of emails, but I do remind students a couple days before it's due, don't forget to apply. So the big keys here from today are to... Understand that the FAFSA does open in October, that while you do have until May the 1st to fill it out, Kathy recommends that you do it before the holiday season, so it's one less thing you have to worry about. Also talking about the Education Foundation and how their scholarship essay contests are open in winter, so when you come back in January, get ready to fill those out, and again in summer. Of course, if you are planning on dropping any classes this term, it is important that you chat not only with the instructor, because that's something else too. I've had students just out of nowhere just drop classes. And, you know, it, it might have been for a specific situation. Maybe they were in the hospital or they've had something in their personal lives going on, which I understand. But honestly, there are occasions where if you work directly with the professor, you can still figure out a way. Um, we do offer incompletes on an as-needed basis. It's not something that's done frequently. But if there's a good reason, we've done that before. Because we, trust me, I personally still, the biggest check I rate every month is for my student loans. And, and I understand that the importance of not having to drop classes. So um, not only can you go to the financial aid office and talk with them about the ramifications of dropping classes, you can also talk to your professors as well. And uh, finally, please make sure when it comes to registration coming up in just another week, uh, when that registration opens, please find somebody to give you some kind of help, whether it's the financial aid department, whether it's the faculty in your department, whether it's records and registration, many, many different ways that we can get some assistance for our students. So, Kathy, thank you so very much for being here today. It's, it's wonderful to learn more about such an important topic. Uh, I wish so bad that when I was in school that I had a little bit more guidance when it came to my financial aid because I, I think that I made some mistakes myself, and I think that's part of the reason that I'm so adamant about trying to at least – educate students on the basics of, of loans, but also scholarships and grants as well. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. And let's not make it a year until we have you back. Again. Sounds great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll have you back in the spring. All right. Well, Kathy, thank you so very much for being here today. It's much appreciated from the nightly news. All right. Well, for the financial aid director, Kathy Shepard, this is Professor Paul Miller, and we will catch you next time on the nightly news podcast. Mm -hmm.